I never do excuses. I never do explanations. I am guilty of my crimes and justly sentenced according to the laws of the time. Don't you know that the music should be solemn? This is Theo Rossi. This is Theory. There's a war going on outside. No man is safe from. Hey, everybody. How we doing? How we doing? Um, Today is going to represent my first step in uh, something that I've been kind of circling for a little while and uh, something that I've really wanted to start um, dedicating a lot of my time to, which was the issue of prison reform, um, mainly uh, in this country. Um, I know it's pretty horrific all around the world. Um, and I know, and I also know, and I'm, and I'm aware that it's an extremely touchy subject for many people and we'll go into why. Um, I believe the prison industrial complex is one of the most insidious, uh, things that we have in our society. Um, and again, I also understand that it's a touchy subject for many, uh, for reasons we'll go into. So on this episode of theory is going to be my first step into uh, learning uh, more about it and then sharing that knowledge with uh, you, the listeners. And I'm going to do that by sitting down with uh, prison advocate Ryan Lowe, um, who I've known for a little while and who uh, is one of the smarter individuals I've ever spoken to in my life. And you'll find out why on this issue. So without further ado, let's go sit down with my fellow human, Ryan Lowe. All right. So we were, we were just actually talking before this. Um, uh, first of all, how are you? I'm amazing. Life <laughs> That's is good, good to hear. We haven't seen each other. We did a film. How long ago was that where we worked together? Oh God, it's gotta be 10 months, 10 months ago. And that was that was the craziest experience for me. I knew I knew a lot of people on the film, um, but what was through what threw me the first couple of days we were on was m- many of the crew were formerly incarcerated. Right? How many years did we have total on that project? I think we had seven hundred years. Seven hundred years, and there were people in all different positions. What were they doing? What were the different positions everyone was in? Uh, we had people from the producerial team all the way down to the art department. We had grips and gaffers and uh, the DIT. We had people in the camera department. We had people um, in transportation. We had PAs. The idea that we had 700 years of prison experience taking over a police station to do a movie about <laughs> racially motivated police violence was not lost on any of us. No. And, and, and what's so – what was so crazy about that, and, and you know, I'll explain obviously a ton of your story, you know, in the intro and all that, but getting, you know, getting into this is like, so we meet, I start learning about everything that was going on, you know, we're doing this, this film that, you know, that'll be out soon. And, and, you know, I, I actually went to, to Venice, Italy to, to when we premiered there. And, that was a big, that, that was, there was a reason we were doing that, right? Like it was part of kind of that, uh, anti recidivism, like getting people back involved who had been formally incarcerated. I think the way I would love to start this with you, because you truly are one of the smartest people I've ever spoken to. And not just on this, but on multiple, on a multitude of things is what does the common and average person not know? about the prison industrial complex, the prison system, and then we can get into the prison reform thing. But just just a quick, like, what don't most people know? Ooh, that's a big scale. Yeah. Um, most people base their experience on the prison of the prison system on what they've seen in media and make the assumption that what they've seen in media is based on reality. And it's simply not. Um, first of all, anybody who thinks the prison system is not about race has never been in one. Hmm. The second thing is economics are as important as race in determining the prison system. So in prison system population, without going too deep into the politics of it already, but being poor and white is in many, in many states, uh, considered 
equal to being black as far as the prison system is concerned. Mm. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is there's this demonization that happens where we assume that someone who's committed a crime is inherently a bad person. And we forget that the, it's the person part that we lose. Hollywood shows us constant predatory behavior and excessive violence throughout the entire system. Does that happen? Yes. Is that the norm? Maybe. But the truth is there's humanity involved in it. They never show that we have Christmas. They never show that we hold funerals and one of our people dies. They never show birthdays. They never show that people share each other's traumas and experience and help each other get through it. We have different ways of doing it than the conventional world does, but they never show that because there's no interest in humanizing the people behind it. So what does most people not know about prisons? They don't know that it's actually people, human beings, not numbers, not statistics, not people who fit into a cute little box or a you know, one-hour narrative that you can strap on. There's people who have complicated life stories and histories that led them to a path that led them where they are and that they will have a life future that leads them out of it. And that's, and that's such a big thing that you, that you just said. And I've been talking a lot about this because I'm diving all the way into this. Um, I, you know, for me personally, um, this is something that has been incredibly ignored, um, forever. Um, and I've tried to, before I go into something, I always think, why is it ignored? Right. I go, why, why don't people get into this? Right. Because if I go set up, because I've done it. If I go set up an organization to save animals, which I've, I've, I'm on the, I'm on the board of some, I'm part of a lot of them. I can raise tons of money and bring tons of awareness. If I just say, I want to go save golden retrievers right now, you'll have people going crazy on GoFundMes and all this stuff. But if I mention prison and prison reform, people are like, well, I don't know about that. And because the assumption is that everyone who's in prison is guilty. That's the assumption, right? And again, because they want to believe in a judicial system that works and that people who go to, right. And we both know that that's silly, right? And, and we're seeing, what we're seeing right now, 2020, the year of vision is that people are going, wait a second. I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And I didn't know this happens. And I didn't know, you know, this statue meant that. And I didn't know that these, this was going on with this group of people and everybody's kind of starting to open up. And I said, Oh, Now's the time. Now's the time to show people, not just because I have friends that are incarcerated, not just because I've had family members that have done long-term years, not all that. It's the fact of that I am stunned that there is really no – prison doesn't have like – there's no end goal. You don't come out and you're like, oh, well, look at that. That really worked. I feel this, this, this. It's like statistically shown that it's not helping. There's something wrong here in the way the whole thing is set up. The challenge is, is your starting assumption. Your assumption is that prisons are designed to make a better population. They're not. They literally weren't designed that way. They were designed to suppress minorities and to create a self-perpetuating cycle. Angola Prison in Louisiana was a slave plantation. On a Tuesday, they took the colors off the necks and put them on the wrists and said, you're prisoners, not slaves. Mm. 13th Amendment. That's why they added the slave, uh, the, the prison clause after abolishing slavery. Yeah. So that prison still works today. You're still required to work for free four years in a field when you get that sentence there. It is literally slavery. It's so insidious. It's like literally, and everyone, most people who have, you know, two brains in their head understand that with that, that that was done as a direct result of abolishing slavery to create the prison system to mimic exactly what was happening there. But meanwhile, no one talks about it because it doesn't, unless it directly affects them, I guess, in one way. And even then, and even then they're helpless. It used to be, um, oh God, 25 years ago, one in 30 Californians knew the first name of somebody who had been under correctional control in the past year as a result of the mass incarceration boom and the war on children with the super predator scare. That number increased to one in three. We incarcerated ourselves into awareness. This prison system did too much damage too fast. And the populace, when you can put a first name to somebody that says, it's not them, it's not they, it's not the others, it's not the person who doesn't look like me, it's Uncle Bob. Mm. It's somebody who you can put a first name whose life and story you know. Now it becomes personal and now you have an understanding. Well, Uncle Bob isn't like all the rest of those people. Well, he kind of is. He's in the same cage as them. 
And before we get too too far ahead of this, you you're very aware and understand this because of your own past history, right? You were and and again, I think a lot of people this is again, this is almost like Prison 101, I'm going to call this, this, this episode, right? This sit down because a lot of people don't know, right? Some people don't even know. Like someone asked me the other day, do I, they said, um, do I still say ex cons? Is that a word? And I said, you know, it's so funny because everybody gets their, their rhetoric and lingo from films. They don't even know what to say to people. Mm-hmm. So as someone who was formerly incarcerated yourself, how many years were you incarcerated? 23 years, 12 days. 23 years, 12 days. Uh-huh. When while you're in for 23 years, 12 days, you went in at what age? 17. You're a child, literally a child. They say the the brain doesn't even form until you're 26 to 28, right? So I went in at the time of the super predator scare. So I was a child until the judge said, "Oh, you're an adult," and suddenly I became a legal adult, just like that. Yeah. And you went to state prison. Yeah. At 17. I- Okay. Before, before I even unwrap that, that entire, uh, bag of tricks there. Um, you're 17. Uh, you go in for explain just so people understand, because I think that's a, a big thing in this. Sure. I want to be careful when I explain this. People understand. Um, I never do excuses. I never do explanations. I am guilty of my crimes and justly sentenced according to the laws of the time. Mm -hmm. So this is never, never should be taken as me saying anything that happened was unfair or unjust. According to the laws of the time, I was justly sentenced and I was guilty of my crimes. Mm -hmm. When I was 17 years old, I took a man's life. Mm -hmm. Society had a right to protect itself from a drug addicted kid who was spinning out of control. Of course they put me in jail. Um, and like I said, I was guilty of it and I belonged where I was. But when, when I went in for the first 16, 18 years, I didn't know the name of anybody who went home. We just died there. There was no hope. This was where you're going to die. And th- was that your, and I'm, and I'm sorry to jump in because I have so many questions. Was that your, when you went in, were you just like, okay, this is it. I'm going to be here the rest of my life. And this is, this is the way it is. Uh, everybody I knew was that way. In California, uh, the, the parole system existed to protect the governor from the political out, fallout of paroling someone. So there wasn't a parole grant rate. People just died there. If you went in with an indeterminate sentence, meaning you didn't have a mandatory outdate, uh, you were not going home. None of us knew anybody who ever went home. So you have a lot to – Except as a person, as a young, as a young person at that time, right? You have the actions, like you said, there was drug addiction. There was all these things that, that had come. There was the taking of someone's lives. Now, now you're in prison. You have to do a lot of like self work on you, right? You're doing all this stuff as you're there and you're in probably, from what I can imagine, one of the worst possible places a human can be, right? So this is all occurring at one time. Is there, there's a moment for everybody in that system, um, and it usually breaks you. It should break you. Uh, you're surrounded in, in, in an environment with people who are under immense amounts of pressure and with massive buckets of trauma, and our society's solution to that trauma is to add more because we think that'll fix it. Um, it is a miracle that people come out of that environment stronger and not broken. Not all of them do. Some of them break. Uh, I was staggeringly blessed to have uh, a group of people who saw potential in me and gave me the opportunity in the political space within that environment uh, and more or less bullied me into getting an education and making something up of myself. Um, and you di- and you did that by I think what did what did uh, what do I know you have six degrees right you did a uh, six different I did uh, I went in. Not for nothing, but I didn't. I didn't come from a gang-infested neighborhood. I, I didn't have an abusive family. I didn't have any of the usual excuses that we see or the usual causes that we see. Um, I came in stupid. I knew I was stupid because everybody told me he was stupid. That's Ryan. He's stupid. They didn't have a word for what was wrong with me growing up. They just called it stupid. Today we call it attention deficit disorder. Uh, they didn't know that putting the really tall kid. I'm six foot four, 
280 pounds. I look like I used to be a reject from the show you were on. <laughs> um, but they didn't know that putting the tall kid in the back of the at school, uh, the back of the classroom at school was a bad idea because he had slanted eyes, not because he's Asian, because his eye muscles were cut during birth and he couldn't read the board. So when the teacher would ask a question, I couldn't give an answer. So everybody just assumed I was stupid. Hmm. When I went in, they made me take an IQ test and I refused and they had a fit about it and we're going to put me in the hole. And I said, I'm not taking an IQ test. And the teacher finally came in to see me and said, why aren't you taking the IQ test? I said, because I'm going to fail. He said, you can't fail an IQ test. And I said, if I wasn't stupid, I would have known that. And so he, I took the test and it came back at 173 and I said, see, I'm stupid. He said, no, Ryan, 173 is really good. I said, well, your test is broken. So he made me take it again and again and again. I took it four times and it more or less came back at the same result. And then I got terrified. That's the scariest place you can be because if you've considered yourself stupid your whole life, then you have an excuse. Then you have a reason. You've just been told to die in prison by a judge. And now this guy with his little test just took away your excuse. Now I don't have an excuse. Now the problem is me. And I can make a choice. I can live down to the expectations or I can choose to live my life in service. Uh, you never get to make up for taking a life, but you can try to make the world a better place. And to my shame, I didn't have the courage to do it. It wasn't until somebody sat me down and said, you can come be one of us, meaning a somebody in the prison world, or you can go be one of them, meaning a square, a civilian living a good life out here. And I said, I can't go be one of them. I'm going to die here. I said, yeah, but what if you could? What if one day people understood the juvenile brain was different? That kids aren't young adults. They're not little grownups. They're actual kids with different brains. What if one day that happened? Would you want to go who, home who you are today? Or would you want to go home as the best version of yourself you can be? I thought, maybe I'll try. Maybe. I, what's the worst can happen? I'll fail again? Gee, I know how to do that well. Sure, I'll try that. And he gave me the space in the political culture to do something that wasn't popular back then. Education is seen as a threat by the prison system. They threw me in the hole a bunch over trying to get an education system. They threw me in the hole for starting an NA group on the yard. They I got bounced around a lot. They didn't like what we were doing. But I had the political cover uh, inside to do it, and I got six degrees while I was inside. Why? Why do you think – why are – the powers that be, let's say, scared of education? Is it because almost like um, that control? It could potentially – It's math. control? It's algebra. There's this common theme in reform movements, and I, I don't subscribe to it, where people see prison guards as evil or whatever. They're human beings. They're people who signed up to do a job. 99% of them didn't get up on a Tuesday and be like, I'm going to go into prison and make people's lives miserable. That's not, that, that's not who they are. They're actual people with life stories of their own that led them to this place. And many of them signed up to do a job that they saw as a service. So, but prison guards themselves aren't the problem. Their organizations, their unions are. Their unions are very, very political active. The right won't touch them because they're law and order. The left won't touch them because they're a union. So they exist in this weird space in between and they're disproportionately powerful entities. They see education as a direct threat. Every single study ever done shows that education is the single greatest determinant of recidivism. It's, you have an inverse recidivism rate once you get a degree. If you get an advanced degree, that recidivism rate drops to less than 1% when it's 70 some odd percent nationally. So they see it. It's just, it's just algebra to them. More education equals less prisoners. Less prisoners equal less prison guards. Less prison guards equal less union dues and less political power. Therefore, education is a threat to our power. It's just algebra for them. So it comes back to money. Of course. So I'm, and I'm a big believer that every single thing can be tracked back to money. If you go down the road long enough, some you only need two steps, some you need 220 to get to it, but you will eventually wind up at the money and the power, the power before the money. So getting into what you're saying and recidivism and understanding for people that are listening to this means going back in after you come out, which is, you know, a pretty high rate for a lot of people for multitude of reasons, right? You know, that, that we'll get into. Um, prisons in general, I think another, uh, common mistake of citizens or anyone that prisons are ran federally by the government, that they are, that they are just 
something put in place to take care of the bad people and they all have the same playbook and the government controls them. That is completely false. Can you just talk about that for a sec? Yeah, we we don't have one prison system. We have 50 two or three prison systems. Every state has their own prison system. The federal government has a prison system. Our territories have prison systems and none of them match. By the way, the federal prison system has federal prisons scattered throughout the country. So if you get arrested in Texas, you might be doing your time in Massachusetts. Uh, But if you get arrested in Texas on a state charge, you'll definitely stay there. By the way, the counties have their own County jail facilities for pretrial detention and lower level detentions. And then cities have their own jail system. So to be clear, we have a massively complex and wildly uncontrolled prison system. We've had the federal government take over prison systems because of abuse. California was killing one person a day through medical malpractice. So a three judge panel from the federal government took over the California prison system and said, you have lost the right to run your prison system. You are killing too many people. And they, so they took away the private ownership of prisons. No, they took away state ownership of prisons. They told California, you don't own your prisons anymore. The federal government owns them. Yeah. For a period of time until such time as we can bring you in compliance. It was called Plata and Coleman. There was a bunch of legal stuff that happened, but essentially a three judge panel said, this is so bad. Your, your, your medical system is so bad. We're taking it away from you. So some of the, so some of the myths or some of the things that could be truth that I've heard that I'd love to get into because this is just as much a lesson for me as the people who are listening to this private prison systems, privately <laughs> owned prison systems, right? Yeah. It's like a business. If they want business to be good. More people need to go to prison who maybe don't necessarily belong there or shouldn't be there or, you know, a bunch of different things. How is that legal would be the way that I want to say it? Or how is that even right? Well, let's look at this scope first. First of all, prison systems are a business, period. They have cottage industries that revolve around them. People have to make the toilets and the bunks and the toilet paper and the things that these prison systems buy. So there are cottage industries around these things. There are multi-billion dollar industries that are dependent upon prisons existing. The private prison industrial complex is essentially a a better mousetrap. A group of people figured out that we, if we don't have the state red tape over our head, can warehouse people differently, cheaper, and make a profit on the difference. So a prison contracts with the state and says, if you keep us at 90% capacity, we can run this prison at this level for this cost. If you can't keep us at 90% capacity, you have to pay us huge contract fees. Arizona has a city called Florence. And if you stand in the middle of Florence, Arizona, everywhere you turn for 360 degrees, all you see are private prisons. Not even Sheriff Joe Arpaio or any of the disaster that is Arizona's legal system could keep enough people incarcerated to keep that many private prisons up at 90% capacity. So they buy people from Hawaii. Hawaii can't afford to build prisons. It's too expensive land. So they're literally selling people to Arizona to incarcerate them. Again, just another second chapter of slavery. It's basically the same thing. Yeah. It's the only so, difference. We just polished it. it. It Right. And 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 packaged it in a different package for, for people. So, okay. So that's the private prison. Now you hear things, uh, I've had friends who are locked up who are like, if I make a phone call, it's this much money, right? They they price gouge on everything that's going on in there. And there's nothing you can do because you're basically, for lack of a better word, a slave to the system that you're put in, right? So you have to, if you want to make this phone call, it's going to cost this much money. Is that true? It's it's quite a bit worse than that. Um, Yes. So basically what you see in a dollar store is what's available on commissary there, but just Multiply the price by five for everything. Uh, and it's your only option. There isn't another option. Like there'll be three or four vendors, but they're all exactly the same products at exactly the same price. It's just a different name on the package that's there. The real scary part of what we're moving to next is the directed monitoring, home detention monitoring systems, right? People see the writing on the wall of the prison system changing. So the private prison systems are moving into home detention monitoring and immigration detention facilities. But that's really about big data. Imagine if you're an internet marketer and you can say, well, gee, we disproportionately lock up 20 year old black males. What do 20 year old black, 20 year old black males want to buy? 
Well, you can guess, or you can put an ankle monitor them and track their behaviors and their movement patterns of every single formerly incarcerated African American male of a certain age and micro target down to where you can put a billboard on the street and know that they're going to be exposed to this billboard based on their tracking. So that's all about big data collection. That's it nefarious. is it's that's super so insidious. <laughs> wow. Right? So when you see these big corporations pushing for home detention monitoring and money coming in from strange places for home detention monitoring, you're like, oh my God, why are these people who are so super pro law and order and lock them up, throw away the key, suddenly throwing money behind this? Then you check back and you realize, oh, they have money. In big data, so so let's get let's get down to the, to the basics of this. Sure, there is no f- basically are people believing because obviously there's a lot of let's use you know the United States as an example. There's a lot of religious people. There's people who believe in forgiveness, or there's people who you know pray to gods that say you know I all this different stuff, right? And it seems that all that thought process goes out the window when it comes to prison, right? They're just like, oh, sorry, you did what you did. I don't care, right? They don't think people can change. They don't think that anybody's ever uh, feels absolutely terrible about what they did. They feel that there is no path to redemption, right? It's just you go in and that's it. And if it's the worst case scenario, it's the worst thing for you. So be it, right? So my, the, there go is a, go, no, well, ask your question. I'm sorry. I didn't no, my it. question would be then if that's the case, I mean, why even try, right? Why not just, why even put people in prison? I mean, why not just, if someone does anything wrong that you consider wrong, why not just execute them, right? Because that's what people are basically doing in one way or another, right? By saying, no, I don't care. Do multiple life sentences. Do this. Do that. Right. We're, we're, again, for me, for someone like me who practices forgiveness in every bit of my life since I was a child, like I have to live like that. And it's really hard when you look at certain things, right? Certain things are definitely, like we said, more insidious than others and more nefarious than others. And certain things hit people worse. But what's the end goal here with prison? What what is it all about? I think that that basic question of what is prison supposed to be doing. So there's the two things at play. First of all, the 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 essential question you originally asking is how do moral people justify the immoral act that is the modern incarceration system? And the mm-hmm. second question is what should it have been? Right. Yep. It's exactly it. Um, there's a sociological phenomenon called moral panic. Are you familiar with it? potentially go for it it's essentially the evil behind every genocide or horrible act behind it it's it happens when a group of people heap the ills of a society on a marginalized group of people and Mm. create what's called a folk devil it's a Mm. fancy way of saying scapegoat Mm -hmm. and then they have a target who they have a first dehumanized and then b otherized so they can heap these ills on them and blame everything on their shoulders. Nazi Germany did it with the Jews. They wore funny hats. They had Shylocks. They didn't look like us. They didn't talk like us. It was their fault. We couldn't get businesses started. It was their, it's how Hitler rose to power. Mm -hmm. Rwanda, they did it. The um, Hutu power radio did a skit that uh, referred to a Tutsi male as a cockroach. And for two years before the Rwanda genocide, anytime Hutu power radio talked about a cockroach, everybody in the country knew who they were talking about. That's the dehumanization process. You can't murder whole villages of people. Moral people don't go around hacking the limbs off each other, but you can do whatever you want to to a cockroach who's responsible for all the ills in your society. You have to dehumanize and separate that marginalized group of people. Prisons literally remove you from the group of people, trap you in a subculture, and dehumanize you by labeling you as X or any other thing other than a person first. It is the, the super predator scare here in America is a perfect example of a moral predator, right? John DeLeo wrote an article for the Weekly Standard in which he created, coined the phrase super predator and everyone mm-hmm. from the Clintons down to Newt Gingrich, who, by the way, give Newt some big credit, owned his role in it, yeah. wrote a very powerful editorial in a conservative paper and said, we screwed this up. Let's fix it. Yeah. Big credit. And, and, and the stuff with Nixon. I think a lot of people are, you know, uh, the war on drugs, which Nancy Reagan continued and just all mm-hmm. the little things that were being dropped in there. And again, we're not even, you know, going back to after 
Jim Crow and, you know, after certain things ended in the 60s, late 60s. So essentially it was designed to remove a certain group of people from the population, population, otherize them, dehumanize them, to allow inhuman acts. People don't – I only did 16 months in solitary, but I know people who have done 42 years. <sighs> You can't lock a person in a bathroom for 42 years with no human contact. Normal people don't do that to each other. Moral people, religious people don't do that to each other. But you can do whatever you want to, to that monster, that predator, that thing that we're scared of. So long as we can forget that he's a human first, we can do whatever we want. Don't get me started on what we're doing to the women we incarcerate. That's far worse than what we're doing to the men. Right. And and again, just in my experience with this, it's like... You know, it's for example, like, um, you know, one of my cousins, you know, who, who's no longer with us, she, she got hooked up with the wrong guy. She starts doing, uh, uh, oxys at the time, right? She, then next thing you know, she's, she's popping oxys. Then she goes up to the eighties. Then she's cutting the oxys, snorting the oxys. Those aren't good enough. She moves up to heroin, right? Now it becomes heroin. Then. You know, her, her mom, my aunt moves her out of state. She's, you know, now she goes into rehab, right? Her, the boyfriend's in jail, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and everybody is slowly and slowly getting more disconnected from it. Like, oh, she's a drug addict. She's this, right? And they're not realizing that there's a problem there. The dehumanization is starting, right? Now, what happens? The worst thing that could happen, you know, uh, she has a little, she has a little girl. She comes out of, rehab and does what a couple of friends of mine have done. She comes out and tries to do the same amount and she ODs and she dies, right? And and she was, you know, super young and and was uh a few months pregnant. And it was obviously completely uh devastating to the entire family. What I realized in that moment was and this and again this is mirroring the prison atmosphere of this was that the second she got hooked on drugs, she was written off as like, oh, she's a drug addict. Not like Wow, that's a really uh, addictive drug. Like that's a bad drug that does bad things. And for anybody that's ever done anything, they understand how drugs can take a hold of people, right? But watching people normalize the behavior that even when she died, they were like, well, that's what happens to drug addicts, right? Because I think it it gives them like it makes them not take any blame on, right? So it's the same thing with the dehumanization of people. And I think that's why this movement is so important that's going on because how I mean, if you look at just the prison population and everybody understands that, you know, what is it? How much percentage is, you know, filled with minorities and 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 how much is, you know, it's it's the numbers are staggering, right? There were two years where I was the only white face in my entire building. <laughs> If you don't think prisons are about race, you've never been in one. And again, the fact that, and this is why I have to stand up and I have to take charge of this. And if I die doing it, I have to, is that even now someone will listen to this. And the first thing they'll think is, I don't know, I mean, I can't listen to this. You know, I had someone that did this, or if someone does something to someone, they're, they're a bad person. And if someone does this, they're a bad person and bad people need to be dealt with. And then my question to them would be, you're right. What is your plan on dealing with people? Because there has to be a plan. And what it seems like in prison is there's no plan. The plan is you're going to die there and we have no path to redemption for you. Uh, yes. And there's a different aspect of it. The, the plan is if you're not going to die there, we're going to ensure that you come back. Our solution to taking somebody who's got a bunch of trauma and led them down a drug path or follow the same path of what you're talking about is to incarcerate them and stick them in a place with a bunch of other people who are suffering from the similar things as if that will somehow make them magically better. <laughs> and then we act shocked, stunned, poleaxed that this person came out and went right back to the behavior only worse. We don't get to be surprised anymore. You don't get to be surprised when they fail 70 some odd. The expectation is to fail for yes. recidivism rate. Yeah. It's designed that way. You don't get to be surprised when you get the results that you're designed for. And then someone said recently, because they were talking about how in New York, you know, most of my family's in New York and they were like, you know, they just let out. And again, I'll probably get these numbers wrong, but that's okay is because it's the point. They were like, oh, they let out 250 prisoners from Rikers and, you know, they were arrested 650 times within the couple of months of coming out. You know, some were arrested all, and they throw out these large numbers, right? Of, and never say, okay, 
can we go backwards? You know, let's talk about the things you and I have talked about, you know, before this and in private is like, okay, the uh, foster care, growing up without parents, you know, growing up, you know, where did you grow up? The, the classism level, what level of, you know, income was the family at? What did you need to do? What no one looks at that. They just look at the bad behavior and they say, well, you know what? You don't need to sell drugs. You can get a job at Blockbuster. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, you don't understand. I mean, Blockbuster's not around anymore. I'm just thinking when I was young. But the thing is, is that nobody really goes too deep into the picture of it. They just look at bad person. That person's a bad person. They don't ask why. They don't ask what happened. So when they start painting people with that brush of, hey, this person's been arrested 11 times, you know, I have a guy and you and I have talked about this. He's, you know, super, him and I are super close now. He did 10 years. He wrote a book called Criminal Incubation. Shout out to my guy, Dre. He's the greatest. He was arrested, I believe, I told you this, 28 times in his life and 26 were from the same police officer. He was targeted because of who he was. He's six foot four. He's black. He's a big guy. And he was in command in Roxbury, Boston, which is one of the most racist places, you know, in, in the country. Again, people don't look at that. They just look at it that he got arrested a bunch of times and he deserved it because of this, 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 and this. I guess that why the media continues to do this can easily, an easy answer would this be, it's money. They want people to keep going back in and they need it. They need an enemy, right? I mean, is that, is that the answer here? Why we're doing this? Because it's fully out of racism and, and holding a certain demographic down. Is that it? In order for the conspiracy of that size to exist, a whole lot of people have to tell the same lies, right? So much, it's much more insidious than that. It's, it's a series of assumptions that happen along the way, right? So are there people who are deliberately? Yes. Yes, there are. We know this from the Erlacher, or, or John Erlich, mm -hmm. yeah. Erlicher. Yeah. Erlicher. We know, we know that directly from his own, from his own mouth, right? With Nixon. So, he was under yeah. Nixon in the statement. Yeah. So there are those people, but the vast majority of these are well-intentioned people acting with bad science and wrong and wrong level of assumptions. These racist base level assumptions that those people need this in their life. And Part again, not taking anything away from, and I just want to be super clear, people do really bad things and Absolutely. deserve that. Let, let's get that right off the table. Society has a right to protect itself from its errands. It's what it does during that protection that either does it make them better or does it ensure that they continue to be a threat to society? And that's what, we're, have, that's what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is, yes, everyone is addressing that people do and society has a right to protect itself and people do bad things. I am not by no means not speaking of that. What I'm saying is this system that is in place to try to right those wrongs, if that's even what is being done, is the thing that I'm really focused on because there's – and again – and then we're going to get into, obviously, how many people have been exonerated, who haven't even done what they've done. And then also the fact that if I have money and you don't, and we get arrested for the same crime, I could post bail and you can't. And now you're, you might be in jail, you know, cause you can't post bail. And so again, that's the stuff that we're going into here. I just want to make that super clear because people get very sensitive around this topic. And they should. L let me give you an, an example. Um, I work with a lot of survivors of violent crime. I do so deliberately. I am upfront with my background. I own my own history, my own role in destroying a family and their lives. And I work with them because we found that the criminal justice system is not just unfair to the accused. It's very unfair to the survivors. It doesn't get them healthy. It doesn't get them in a place where the trauma that they've experienced is in any way repaired. All it does is give a sense of vengeance and then leave them burning with a hole. So we try to work with this restorative justice model. Um, we've had some quite amazing successes. We'd have a guy who was out looking for drugs in the middle of the night and broke into a car, bumped into a sleeping woman in the back of the car, stabbed her and ran away. Mm. She passed away. That young lady's daughter sought out the man who killed her father, her mother, and just wanted to know why they're great friends today. 
He's out here working uh, and building a life. She's up building a life and her life is better now that she's met and had a sit down and understands what had happened in that incident. Doesn't, it doesn't excuse the incident, doesn't make it better, but it does help the people heal. So the existing model of justice that's revenge based and doesn't lead anyone healthy at the end, doesn't restore anyone in any way. Mm we've got to find a different model, a different way of doing business. That's more community based, more people centric, still protects society from its errands. We can't have people who are actively harming others out in society. We all understand that, but making them worse. Isn't the solution. It can't be. We've tried it for too long and continue to fail at it. And then also when you add in the, the, the drug aspect of it, right? I mean, now, I mean, we're talking how many people have been locked up. I mean, I, you know, friends when I was young who've been locked up, just let's use marijuana as an example and cannabis and have been locked up forever. And now I can go online right now if I lived in California and get weed delivered to my door or, you know, I can be here in Texas and order CBD, which is basically the same thing, just taken out to THC. It's like a net you have people rotting in prison for something that corporate America, for lack of a better word, is making a, a shit ton of money off of right now. Shouldn't that be, oh, if we're going to make this legal, we need to release every single person that's inside on marijuana charges? Wouldn't that I just be <laughs> You're preaching to the choir on that. The drug war was never about drugs. The drug war w was about economics and control. Um, yes, drugs have led – the criminalization of drugs has led to mass incarceration. It succeeded at what it was trying to do. But we absolutely need to reach parity. We've only just now started reaching parity between crack and powdered cocaine. The know, primary so difference weird. being white people used powder and – we had a myth that African Americans used more crack cocaine, which was simply not true. White Americans used more crack cocaine, mathematically speaking, but Hollywood sold that myth. Yeah. And I mean, you couldn't turn on TV in the eighties without seeing a black face and hear crack killer, crack baby, crack crying, crack whore, crack, 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 crack. And we sold that myth. And so we passed law saying, Oh my God, those evil black people are going to come rape my daughter and break into my house. And so 10 times the, the time for the wait. In crack. And the only difference is baking soda and water. Shut up. Yeah. And Chappelle, I mean, Chappelle did a skit on it where literally if a cop would, you know, kill somebody by mistake, he'd be like, just sprinkle some crack on him and let's go, you know, and it'd be like, oh, he had crack on him. He must be a horrible person. And, you know, growing up in New York and well, me, what I know was in the eighties, like crack was, you know, that was the thing. Oh, crack was here. The guys on Wall Street are doing cocaine and anybody who was in the hustle and anybody who was logical goes, it's the same thing. I don't understand, right? But, but And again, it was just the way they separated it. And this is where I've always said Hollywood, and you and I met on a film, Hollywood is slightly complicit in this because Hollywood has always painted criminals a certain way. Drugs a certain way that influences culture. And, and again, prison, they've painted prison a certain way to people that, you know, they paint prison in a way that people almost go like, ooh, yeah, everybody in there is bad and there's gangs and there's this and they're worse and I don't want them out on the street and I don't want this. And again, it's because Hollywood's reflection of things has always been up until hopefully now, and this is where I'm hoping it's changed. This person's a criminal. This person's the good guy. This person's this. This person's that. And they paint that picture in the coloring book of your mind. And then every viewer sees that and goes – now they don't realize maybe it's it's so deep in their subconscious that after watching a few episodes of LA Law or Hill Street Blues back in the 80s, they walk out and go, oh, that's a bad person. That's a bad person. I bet you it's crack on him. And it's like that has been put in their mind. So like you just said with the drug stuff, right? That's one aspect that's crazy, right? The other thing is, and I know they just passed the law, was them throwing out life sentences to to teenagers, right? <sighs> Yeah. So California, we are now getting rid of uh, as much of that as we possibly can. And Texas, you guys have a bill coming up uh, pretty soon um, where young adults who were tried, young, youth who were tried as adults uh, have to wait 40 years before they can have a parole hearing uh, in your state. Now, your state has been actually quite well, quite good on juvenile justice with a few glaring errors. This is one of them. Uh, there's a bill coming up soon in your, in, in your state house. Um, that will rectify that situation. But in California, we've now moved the age at which we consider 
a youthful offender up to 25. Because this, it's just bringing it in line with the science. We know, brain science, that the brain does not harden pathways until the age of 25, plus or minus. There's always variances, yeah. and it's a bell curve. But the fat part of the bell curve is at 25. And we, we're just bringing the science into what like every parent knows, that kids do dumb shit. Gee, what a surprise. Right. Right? And treating children as if they were adults makes no sense. The only time we do that is when we're mad at them. You can't drive a car. You can't have sex uh, legally. You can't serve in the military. You can't vote. No, you can't have a voice in your destiny because you are not adult. You don't have agency. But if we're mad at you, God damn it, you're an adult. You can get tried as an adult. Yeah. In California, you could be tried as an adult at 14 for a while. But what does that mean? Now, now again, just to explain this to people who you know uh, don't understand this. How- how can you be tried as an adult if you're not an adult? So we had a process called 707B. Uh, it's, I don't want to get into the legal numbers of it, but it's essentially a series of criteria, one of which was, quote, seriousness of the crime. So the thing, same thing that could trigger a hearing to whether or not you should be tried as an adult was a qualification to be tried as an adult, meaning by definition, once the hearing was triggered, you were automatically going to be found as as an adult. There was no like going the other direction. And that means that all the protections that we afford youth, meaning special ways of interviewing and uh, sending them to juvenile halls or diversions, all of those go out the window. All of that goes away. You are no different than a 65-year-old man sitting in front of a judge and a jury. Even though you have no clue, you still think you know Santa Claus is coming in some right. cases or if you believe in the freaking Easter Bunny, and you're well, sitting- when I was young, when I was young, you used to get juvenile delinquent cards and you know YDs and JD cards, and then that was always like the gateway to like, okay, once we got enough of these, or once they started getting you, the next thing you can go to juvie hall and you can go to the like it was just the way, the pathway to a bad place. That's the way they painted it for you. Yeah, they just removed the pathway. Now that's just an, it's a binary. Now you're here or there. Hmm. And once you're in the system, I mean, they're really good at getting people into the system. They're atrocious at getting people out. And again, that's it goes back to the money. Of course, they got to keep people there. Mm-hmm. And the taxpayers and all the you know all the things the states are paying the private prisons and all all the money that's flying all over. Oh, the the taxpayers are are the biggest rube in this whole thing. Look, people are simple. If you can scare someone enough, he'll vote for anything. If you can't scare them, but you show them how much it's going to cost them personally, not a random $10 billion number, but it's going to cost you $30,000 a year personally or $3,000 a year out of your check personally, they'll vote for anything. If you can't scare them and you can't show them how much it's going to cost them, but you can show them how they can be a good member of whatever group they identify with, be it party, union, whatever. You can be a good member of this group. If you vote this way, then they'll vote for anything. Only when you get through all of those can you get to logic. Hmm. starts with fear and the prison system is trades on fear it starts trades on the top level of this little voting thing california has borrowed a stunning amount of money we're the fifth largest economy in the world and we have poured a stunning amount of money into a demonstrably failed system and our solution is to pour more money into it we built 33 prisons in the time we built one university If a budget is a moral document, that tells you where your priorities are. They determine how many jail beds they need by early school testing scores. If early school testing scores are low, they know that in 20 years they're going to need more jail beds. Just by looking at testing scores of kids in school. Yeah, particularly minority schools, but kids in school. And they say, well, we're just going to throw this many people away, so we'll need this much more beds. And I'll tell tell you what's something that's super insidious and and again if if anybody who's listening to this thinks that I'm I all I'm doing is just giving facts and things that I've seen and you know like in in New York for example the public schools legitimately look exactly like prisons right they're painted the same way that they're mm-hmm. the bathrooms are the same everything is set up if you've been to a prison and you've been to public certain public schools they are especially in certain communities they look exactly the same it's almost like a preparatory to go to prison right and then if you go to certain private schools right they're beautiful totally mm-hmm. different right night everything is n- night and day like like you know looks like a a bed and breakfast compared to these public schools that are set up to look and mirror prisons, right? 
And again, all this stuff, that's where the systemic nature of this comes, right? Because there, there's a, there's, I'm not saying that it's, uh, targeted, but there is a belief and a hope that certain people go to prison and certain people do things wrong to get to fund this big monster that we're talking about, right? Now, people like Angela Davis, you know, one of my heroes who wants to abolish the prison system, you know, and, and things like that. I, I, I don't know the answers to that. That's, you know, way far down my education level on this specific topic. I do know that in just my short time of getting involved in this and looking at this, that it doesn't work, right? Just like, um, being a drug addict and going to prison doesn't work. You need true rehabilitation, right? You need, you, you can't, I, from what I know, I don't think that being locked in a cage, suffering from addiction is the best way to get better. I mean, maybe you have a different opinion of that. I, I don't think that's it. Now, I, on this, you and I are in complete agreement. Um, I'm an incrementalist. I, that's not a popular opinion in the reform movement. People like big, flashy swings at the bat. I want to get it right. I want to get it right. I take successive approximations to a goal, small, testable, measurable steps, but I do so on each tier. So look, I have to be in this work. I grew up in a prison. Everybody I know and love who doesn't share my blood is in a cage, and I'm never going to be okay with that. If I have, if I'm going to look myself in the mirror in the morning, I got to know that I die empty, that I gave everything I had to bring these people back. I can't hold anything back. If I don't die empty, then I'm not doing enough. But that's my choice. I live that way. I don't expect everybody else to die on the same hill as me. Like everybody has to pick wh where their line is. What I ask of people is understand that by taking these incremental steps, I can ensure that the people out here are protected. The people in there are protected. I take steps inside. We take steps outside. We make life as, as, as survivable as we can inside. We put, make sure that there's less people inside. But we do this in a manner that's, that's safe and responsible, that we can gather the data and have the hard science. Because when we base this on emotion and fear, we make bad decisions. What do you think about the people who listen to this and say, I don't think anybody inside should have anything easy? I think they should rot and, and I don't care. They're, they should have no rights. They should be in the worst positions possible. What's the thought of that? Then I say, I hope you live next to them when they come home. <laughs> Do you want the scariest version of the person who you broke in the first place to come out scarier and more broken? Because they're going to come out some point and they're going to live next to you. I personally have people I love out here and I want them living next to the best people they can. And I think if we make better people, we make a healthier and safer society for us all. And there is the rub of this whole thing, right? Because there is a picture that is painted. There is a belief that is painted. And again, especially, you know, you see it a lot when things happen to certain people. They want the absolute worst for that person that has wronged them, right? Mm -hmm. They want the absolute worst. And then there are some like myself and like others that say, I need to dive into this for a minute. I need to understand it. While I may be angry, I need to understand what's going on here, right? Yes, do I think that some people are just bad people and some people, you know, I think there's a, a line in Batman that say, you know, what does he want? And say some people just want to watch the world burn. You know, yes, there are some people that have bad intentions all the time. You know, I, I call them almost like they have like devil face. Like they just, they have that. And I understand that. And even that, I would still probably dive into and want to know more about because I want to understand that nature. But that being said, you just made an incredible point. If this prison system isn't a, the reform system, whatever you want to call it, is better. Like you said, they are going to get out. Some don't. Some don't. Um, but they're going to get out. And if they get out, what kind of person is coming out of there? Now, you touched briefly before on women in prison. And we talked about that. Can you just explain why that is such a big concern of yours now? I, I do. Uh, first of all, I want to say, uh, I'm preface this by saying, um, I am not the messenger for this. Right. I'll talk about it. But it, when we talk about prison reform for women, 
we oftentimes have experts, guys who look like me and who, who you know, I've testified before the, the, the House and the Senate. I've, I've been done all that and I, my bona fides are fine. But the truth is I know absolutely nothing about what it's like to be a woman in prison. Hmm. We should be talking to Andrea James or any one of the thousands of women who are part of the National Association – or sorry, the National Council of, of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And we're going to, for sure. The, those That's who we talk to. Like if we're going to be authentic about this, having some Sons of Anarchy reject biker looking dude coming out here and talking about what it's like to be a woman in prison, I have no business doing that. But why – but tell me on the on the large 10,000 sure. you know, foot view, why is it different? Sure it is. Um, we socialize women differently. In this culture, we socialize men to be individualists. You're supposed to be able to handle it. You're a man. All the bullshit that we heap on our kids, right? Because we were broken people. Mm -hmm. uh, but we socialize women to be in groups. And then we lock them away and treat them as if they were men. We have well-meaning advocates, guys like me, who write programs for men's prisons and then we strap a bow on it, color it pink, and call it a woman's prison. When the truth is, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing in a woman's prison. CIW, the California Institute for Women, has five times the national average of suicidality rate. Wow. Think about that. If it was a men's prison, we would have shut it down decades ago. Five times more women kill themselves in this prison than anywhere else in the country, and it's still going. Wow. This is a problem. We socialize women differently, and we did not write the incarceration experience for them. Now, as a matter of raw numbers, we vastly, vastly incarcerate more men than women. But as a function of statistics, they are the largest growing population. Here's, here's the insidious part of this, right? We don't just lock up women in prison. We lock them up in society. When we snatch the primary breadwinner, because we pay women 80 cents on the dollar for what we pay men, which mm -hmm. is stupid, but when we snatch the primary breadwinner out of the, out of the household and throw him in, the, all the financial burdens fall on her. 80% of all financial burdens of incarceration fall on women. Think about that. 80% of all financial burdens of incarceration fall on the shoulders of women. That's just math. They're responsible for the phone calls, for the packages, for paying for the visits that go up there. We all know that family connection is one of the keys to successful reentry. Maintaining that family connection is expensive. Now it's falling on the most economically vulnerable, right? People who make only 80% of what the person who just snatched out of their community makes. Then they're responsible for now all of the children and all the childcare themselves. Then we're going to add on price gouging on packages and the stuff that needs to make their loved one feel safe and alive while they're inside. Forget bail. That's a whole different animal. And then when we incarcerate the women, we treat them like they're men mm -hmm. to say nothing of the predatory behavior that happens when you have men obsessed with power put in power over women who had none to begin with. Gee, what a surprise women get pregnant in prison. <laughs> like. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and I'm not bagging on men. I'm one myself. I'm not saying women are inherently victims. I know too many women who can kick my ass. But what I am saying is that power disproportionate – sorry, the power disparity between a prison guard and a incarcerated woman, the rates of predatory behavior are through the roof. I don't know a single female prisoner who doesn't have a sexual abuse story. Not one. And I know hundreds who I see – all the time. I don't know a single one who doesn't have an abuse story. Not one. And again, then you hear that outside voice of, of civilian or whatever you want to call it, where people go, well, shouldn't have been in prison in the first place, right? That's, that's their answer kind of to everything, right? Then I ask the question is, good, then I'd like you to be the one to stand up there and sentence her to be raped. Hmm. Please stand up on the podium. You announce the sentence. Ma'am, I'm sentencing you to be raped. And, and and again, that those numbers are so staggering and it's so true. It's like building a system. It, it's almost like in the in its most simplistic form, it's like building a, a, a building a bathroom that the ceilings are only five feet high, but people are over five feet are gonna hit their head every time. It's like you're building prisons that are 
by the way, are awful to begin with and they're built for men. And now we're putting women in that exact same situation. And then, by the way, also children. We're putting children in that exact same situation. So knowing knowing a lot of this info and then getting into truly the the systemic racism of all this, right? To getting into this, we understand what we touched about on in the beginning of this was this is an extension of slavery, no doubt, right? You'd have to be a fool not to see that. Um, and it continues to this day, right? And now so deep into it that this now is we have, I think I just saw recently that finally they're going to get people who are on parole or allowed to vote, right? We're trying to give. Well, so we have a bill in California where we're working on that. Florida just refranchised 1.6 million people. That is the biggest game changer ever. Um, we, Those of us in the advocacy field knows that we're always one bad incident away from the pendulum swinging back the other direction until such time as the right to revolt is restored. Everything we're, every, every reform we've gained is literally one narrative shift away from going back the other direction until reenfranchisement happens. It's the single most important goal, period. Why is it so important? Make make people understand why is it so important for for people who are on parole or people who are formerly incarcerated to vote. Prisons as a tool of control and oppression only work if the people who you are controlling and oppress never get a voice. Right? If there's a constituency, you can't treat them that way. If there is no constituency, they have no voice. No one cares what they think on a political sphere. They have nothing to negotiate on a political sphere because they have no vote. Once that right to vote is restored, treating people as inhuman goes out the window because then now there's real political consequences. If you voted for the omnibus crime bill, that was a, such a global disaster, you would be removed. You would no longer be able to have that voice executed, right? It's, it's giving agency back to the people who have been treated as subhuman, hmm. giving them that back means now that politicians have to consider the consequences. They can't just say, well, they're not people. They can't vote. We don't care. They have to consider them as people because now they can move. Remember, Florida has been the linchpin in the last several presidential elections. I think it was, what, 63,000 votes or something like that. They just reenfranchised 1.6 million people yeah. in a place that decided the last two presidential campaigns can control the whole state, which can control the whole election. 1.6 million people can flip the entire national script. If they vote. If they vote. Now, again, Florida is a different animal. We have a lot of religious-based voting down there. We have, we have a lot of people who are formerly incarcerated and are going to be supporting Trump. We have a lot of people who are formerly incarcerated and are going to be supporting Democrats. They don't care who it is. Personally, I, as far as pol po politics and party loyalty, I don't care. I will work with left. I will work with right. I will work with anybody because people are dying and I need to stop it. I don't care about your party identity. And and that being said, right, the people, when they get out of prison, what I've seen, and again, we worked with, you know, uh, some of the actors on the film, a lot of, you know, we said the grips, camera, there were so many different people on that. And then again, in my own personal life, what I've always found the hardest thing to do, we talked about this briefly with foster care, like you're thrown out of foster care when you're 18. It's almost like you're thrown, you know, when you're out of prison. You've done however so many years, you know, 20, 10, 5, you know, whatever it is. And then it's like, okay, good luck. Oh, and by the way, you have stuff with parole, right? You have anytime you go on a job application, you have to write, you know, what went on. You're going to, you're, you're, you have the scarlet letter on you for life, right? It's already hard enough. Life in itself is hard enough, right? Now, however many years we just said, you come out. There has to be a better way, right? There has to be a better way. So is voting is one part of that. We know that uh, a group you work with that I was introduced to, ARC, right? Um, Anti-Racidism Coalition, which, you know, comes out and kind of helps so people don't go back by offering life experiences and certain things. And they're, they're doing so many different things. What are some of the ways that people, just to educate, can be aware of? of that like cuz i think i think that that's maybe the easiest i don't want to say easiest none of this is easy the easiest thing is when when those who get out and like you said are now amongst 
everyone. What's the best way to give, to make them live their best life, to make them, to, to make them feel a certain, like, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way of like how to get people to be aware that how many people go right back in. I built my film company. I, I run a small film company that trains systems impacted individuals in the production of media and then employs them in the field. Uh, but I also built it to educate the field on what it looks like. You talked about before, Hollywood is complicit in this. They own part of this damage. Their narrative control, when they make a movie about soldiers, they hire soldiers. And they make a movie about firefighters, they hire firefighters. And they make a movie about prisons or foster care, they hire cops. That's why there's a sudden, unexpected man rape in a shower in every prison movie ever made. They never show birthdays or Christmas. And cops are always portrayed as the heroes, no as matter it, what. So when we bring in the authentic voice of people who live, that movie we did together, mm -hmm. all of those people, we had that a big sit down meeting where we just talked about what this really looks like from people who really lived it. That lived experience you can't buy. So we provide a, that consulting service to Hollywood films and to television to help change the narrative. If you want to do a movie about prisons, I'll bring you 50 prisoners, formerly incarcerated people to work on your set. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you when it's bullshit and they'll tell you when it's real and they'll work their ass off. But as far as letting people know about how to succeed, look, my guys learn the first thing we learn in prison is how to make a lighter out of salt water. If I told John Q. Citizen that I can make you a lighter out of salt water and that every formerly incarcerated person in California can do the same because it's one of the first things you learn, their mind is blown. It's not just outside of the box thinking, it's thinking there's not a box. Right. I'm I, I'm literally trying to figure it out in my head, and I can't even think about it. But I'll I'm, show you next time I'm we're way, together. Yeah, it's, I'm way it's too a, stupid. To it's a about. super easy trick. It's okay. two paper clips and some water. It's like it's really easy. It's unbelievable. But that kind of ingenuity, building amazing things with nothing, is a skill set that all of them possess. They need to know how to survive out here. Like the single leading cause of of continued struggles for long term offenders or lifers. Uh, is relationship drama. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You're going to take a group of people and the only members of the opposite sex that they know are paid by the state to shoot them. Hmm. You think they have a little difficulty dealing with the opposite sex? Yeah. And that's not talking about the trauma before going in. No, that that's just what's happening inside. So the only women men know inside are female prison guards who are literally paid to shoot them. Yes, they have difficulties dealing with the opposite sex when they come out. To say nothing of what it is for the women, it's far worse, but I, I don't get to speak on that. Right. Um, like, understanding that these – let me tell you a quick little story. Uh, I took a guy – now, this kid went to prison at 16. He went to prison at 16. He's a small little kid, um, grew up in a gang neighborhood, and – he turned, he had a 16 month prison term. He turned that 16 month prison term into 42 years because he was a small kid thrown in the shark tank and he was fighting for his life. He spent 16 years in solitary confinement when he paroled. Uh, he wanted to, he, he was like lost. And I just picked him up in my car and I got a trunk full of stuff in the car for him, right? I got laundry soap and clothes hangers and just the things that he doesn't know that he's going to need, but I know he's going to need because I've been in his shoes before. And I take him to the beach. Because he says, I want, I want to go to the beach. I want to be in water that I can immerse my body in. I haven't been able to immerse my body in water in 42 years. Wow. And he gets to the beach and he sticks his hands up in his armpit and closes his chest. He goes, yep, that's the beach. Let's go. He's terrified. He's not terrified of the water. He's terrified that if he takes off his shirt, people are going to see his tattoos and they're going to read it like a billboard that says, criminal, gangster, be scared of me. And all he wants in the world is for no one to ever be scared of him again and for him to just find a job and to live a life. And he won't take off his shirt to get in the water because he's so scared people are going to read his ink. He doesn't realize that that 16-year-old in too small of a bikini has half as much ink as him. Tattoos don't mean the same thing anymore. No. In his world, they meant something back in the day. Today, they don't mean like, – people who never no, earned a drop of ink are no, wearing it. No, yeah. So I'm bigger than him and meaner than him, and I picked him up and I threw him in the water, and he's a 16-year-old kid again, trying to figure out which waves to go over and which ones to go under and getting it wrong all the time. But I'm able to do that because I know where his head is because I was there. I lived that. I had that fear. 
what I'm saying is empower people with lived experience so that they can empower the ones coming behind them. I am able to do this because people took a bet on me. You saw on that set, my guys are the first souls on that set the and best. the last ones to leave. The best. Because they want it more than anybody else. They got something left to prove and they know it. Yeah. They will still, work themselves to, to death. To a bunch of them. I mean, it's, it, it was just again, and it's like that opportunity. It's like when I, when I went over to, you know, Kuwait and, uh, Iraq and, and, you know, um, and I was over in Baghdad. I stayed at Camp, uh, Fort Hood. No, not Fort Hood. That's in Texas. I was at Balad Air Force Base. Mm hmm. And I went over there and I was with these guys and I went over because I was shocked and stunned by the veteran suicide rate. It was like over 20 a day. And I was like, well, what's going on here? Like, this is, this can't be. And, and I was, the people I was meeting, you would, they were so incredible. These women and men, you know, uh, who I was meeting. And then it, it was blowing my mind that when they're coming home from downrange, that this large number were taking their lives. Right. And I started to, really start looking into that. And what I started seeing the programs that were working were form other veterans, taking them on camping expeditions, taking them here. You know, a lot of them just wanted to be in groups. They wanted to be, you know, because they missed having the companionship of the, the brothers or sisters they were next to. So there was veterans helping veterans, right? There was, they were like, you understand me, right? I think that that's what you just said is such an important thing, right? Because Someone who's in 42 years gets out and some person who's never done a second of time or dirt or done anything wrong in their life is going to tell you this, 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 and this. And they go, you don't understand anything. But someone like you, someone who's been in the situation, someone who has awareness of it can say, I get it. Theo, you just, you're brilliant, by the way. You just instinctively touched on something that's one of the biggest shockers for most people in the world. Um, Post-deployment syndrome is diagnostically identical to post-incarceration syndrome. Wow. They are the same thing. The brain can't tell the difference based on the geography of the trauma. A bullet fired at you in Fallujah to your brain is the same as a bullet fired at you in Folsom. Wow. They have the same problems. They only feel comfortable around people with shared experience. They get startled in large groups of uncontrolled people. They have difficulty making the base level decisions of life and they do really well under pressure, mm. right? It's, it's, there's no fucking difference when you look at the two. This is why uh, I'm on the board of a veterans charity out here that helps veterans returning from war, homelessness, or incarceration reenter the society. And it also uh, helps them navigate the veterans justice statutes out here mm -hmm. because we disproportionately lock up veterans because we don't provide them the services and gee, what a surprise, they start falling into problems. Whatever, we're working on that out here. But some of the most successful programs we see out here are the union of the two, right? Where veterans are working with formerly incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people are working with veterans. Often they're the same because we have a staggering amount of veterans in prison. Mm -hmm. But that nature of the directly impacted, whatever that area is, working on it, that's the basis of ARC. And you're right. They're an amazing organization. And I'll introduce you to the executive director, Sam Lewis. He's a dear friend of mine. And you can have him on the show or whatever. But And when you're out here in LA, I'm going to take you down to the offices and walk yeah, you around I and do that wait. thing. And we'll take you down to Homeboy Industries, which yeah. is another one down here. Father Greg Boyle he and Hector Verdugo. He gangs, yeah, forever, right? Father Greg is the only person I've ever known who can literally walk in the middle of, gun, of a gunfight and get both sides to stop shooting just because he's there, and everybody respects him. How long has he been doing it? I, I'm pretty sure since Fred Flintstone was rolling down <laughs> yeah, forever. the boulevard. He dedicated his whole life to it. And I'm not – I've met some of the most powerful people in the world, and I'm not in awe of many people, and I still get in awe of Father Greg. And Hector Verdugo, his number two out here, was on your other show, yeah. The Mayans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the point is, he is uh, that sort of – his motto is, nothing stops, stops a bullet like a job. Hmm. You want to make the world a safer place? Stop discriminating based on employment. In my, in my area of work, having a, a screwed up past isn't a, a detriment, it's a requirement. I want yeah. the broken people because they want it more than the guy who grew up with a bunch of privilege. hundred, a million, gazillion percent. And it's so strange to me that it seems so logical and people don't understand that, 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 
in my industry or any industry I've been in, the people who want it more, the people who need it more, the people who rely on it always do better in every single way, right? And the ones who are entitled, and again, I, I can get in, that's a whole different story of me. I don't want to, I don't want to tear apart the entire Hollywood mm -hmm. business, but I but, mean, I literally have watched people who get everything handed to them who were in a hundred million dollar movie when they were 18 cut to a couple of years later, not just are they the worst human being you've ever been around? Are they the most egotistical, horrible to everyone? But they don't even understand what real life is like, right? Now me, I started as an extra. I was, I didn't even get into acting until I was 24. I worked my way up for years and years and years. And then obviously my life changed in 08 with Sons of Anarchy. And it's like, I, it's so precious to me because I understand the whole thing. Now, when we're talking about veterans, we're talking about, you know, formerly incarcerated individuals. It's like people who come out and understand that they're given an opportunity. I do think, and it's kind of where our world is at now, I think that a lot of people live in fear because of the systemic nature of this country, that a lot of people who are in power, who pull the strings, have never been in a position of anything like that. They've never had a son or daughter who's had to go downrange, who's had to join the military. They've never had a son or daughter or, or a family member who's been locked up potentially, right? And I'm talking like big CEO types, people who are at higher levels. And until that pendulum starts swinging the other way, the people who are always going to be in control are always going to be giving it to people who are just similar like them, right? The country club lifestyle that I've seen. I've always been blown away by that because the only people I want to hang around with, the only people I want in my life are people with life experiences good, bad, or indifferent, and people who have been through the fire and come out the other side. I also am a forgiving person. I have forgiveness in my heart for everything. I've always been, I couldn't, I couldn't be here today if I didn't, right? In every way, from people forgiving me or me forgiving people. I'm fascinated that we've come to live in a society where forgiveness is like literally way down the road now. Nobody cares about it anymore. It's attack, 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 d d abolish, get rid of, get, cancel, get rid of this, do that until everything is burned to the ground and nobody's standing. So now I know, I know that me getting involved in prison reform is a risk for me. I understand that. I understand that a lot of people are going to look at me and say, why would you ever do that? Because whether when I started in this, in this game where I had any notoriety, I started with the men, men and women of the military and I started with animals. Both of those are voiceless voiceless entities, right? They, they are voiceless. To me, the prison, the prison system is the most voiceless even more than that because there's no one talking about it. Now, a little more than ever, you and I are sitting here talking about it. Common has been amazing with it, right? I watch your stuff with Danny Glover. He was great. I'm watching more and more people, you know, obviously we know what ARC and Scott Butnick and people who have, you know, we just talked about other people who have gone in Lucas, Nate, people who are getting in, but it does still strike fear into people's heart because they can't understand it. And if I can make one person understand it, I've done my job. Absolutely. This I don't expect the world to care about my issue, right? I don't. I, I expect the world to care about something. Hmm. If we, It's been my experience that when somebody cares about passionately about an issue, then Yes, it can direct their life, but more importantly, that they can recognize that the, the, that issue is complex and it's never a black and white dichotomy. That's right. That those of us who are storytellers do the world a disservice. When we fail to paint something as complex. And if you care about something, anything, I don't care what it is. If you're passionate about something, anything, and then that passion will empower you to understand what other people are dealing with in their area and you become better and more accepting of everybody else's struggles. This is my hill. This is what I've chosen to fight for. I will continue telling stories and working to make the world a safer place. My ultimate goal is to end the practice of trying children and adults in this country, period, full stop. But other people want to end solitary confinement. I work with them. I work with them on that. People want to work on veterans. I work on that with them. But we all use the same techniques every time. And it's because it's successful. And I'll tell you what it is. It's really simple. 
I will sit down with a lawmaker. I will sit down with a business leader. I will sit down with somebody. We will talk. We will tell stories. And then they'll find out that this person was in prison. Hmm. I lecture at USC 12 times a year or so, plus or minus, uh, to the graduate school, at social work, to the law school, whatever. I do my entire presentation. They're just assuming I'm a biker-looking lawyer all the way through it. Only in the last 10 minutes of it did they find out that I've been to prison and the room is floored. Because the psychology says, well, he can't be the expert. See, I used to do it the other way around. I used to start the class off telling them that I'm formerly incarcerated. And it was like the fucking rock cats. He would watch an entire room of people crisscross their legs, open their notebooks, pull out their pen. Suddenly, I was a client to be studied. That's I wasn't right. the expert to be listened to. And the judgment started. Immediately. So now I save it to the end of the presentation. Now I'm the expert through all I the wish information. I would have known that. I would have saved this to the end of the presentation. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't it's get okay. the memo. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but I'm no longer the client to be studied. I'm the expert providing information. And then I point out to them what what just happened right now in your decision making. I just went from somebody to be listened to to somebody to be studied. Hmm. Face that in yourself. And realize that that's an unconscious judgment that you have, that that person with that background can't be someone to be listened to. They can't be above the line on a film. They can only be the grip. That's right. They can't be the person in charge. They have to be the subordinate. Once you face that that's inside of you, that decision-making has to change because you won't be able to live with it. When we sit in a lawmaker and we sit down and have dinner with them and they're laughing at the jokes and I tell them, by the way, the person you're sitting next to came home last week. They were gone for 25 years. Are you still scared of him? You were just laughing at his jokes. Hmm. Now he is a human being whose name and face he knows. By the way, this is Bob. Bob went outside the wire and downrange in Iraq for five tours. Still think he's just a number? Right. He just lost his roommate to suicide. Can we talk about veteran suicides? It's putting the faces of the stories in front of people, and you almost sadly have to trick their bias that's coming with them, right? Because these cultural biases that you and I have spoken about, and obviously I've spoken about this at length with all my friends, is, again, Hollywood's complicit in this. The news is complicit in this. This has been going on forever, that there is a certain picture that is painted of certain things, which now all goes into that subconscious. And then people, without knowing a story, without knowing anything, like you just said, you could sit down and talk to someone, have a meal with them, and they're like... What an amazing dude. How great. Oh, man, he's so great. And then they hear at the end and they go, oh, oh, wow. And then they'll drop a line like what I hear sometimes. And it's funny because, you know, all my friends are street kids. You know, we all whatever a certain way. And you'll hear the thing. I think the most offensive thing that it's ever said to any of us is you're so well spoken. And I go <laughs> and I go, wow, that is like people don't realize that is the biggest backhanded the comment. <laughs> That you can say, did you expect me to be a, a, a complete idiot? Did you expect me to never study, to not know anything, to be? And again, that's just the thought process. And that is such a bias that when people say that, I'm like, wow, I, 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 I almost laugh at it now. Like you just did. I'm just like, wow, really? Okay. Okay. And I know they know nothing about anything. So again, where we started with this, where I promote educate, educate, educate. This is just the beginning. This is just the first one. You know, I, I appreciate you so much. And I, more, more importantly, I appreciate not just what you do, but your journey in all of this and, and how the way you take on not just responsibility for your own life, but the life of so many others and what you're trying to do. So what you just said was your mission when you started this was to get children not tried as adults. How is that and where does that stand now? Because that was your mission in this country. Where is that at right now? So we're working on it. We, we are. We have greatly reduced the numbers and California and as leading the country in it. And Texas is catching up to us with the exception of a few little areas that we have to work on. Mm -hmm. Other states uh, are, are following the model. Like they're understanding that the juvenile brain is different. But it's a narrative failure that we got in this place in the first time. It's a failure of storytelling. And so we shape the battlefield of social discourse with our storytelling. And so it, I, well, I take a long-term view of this. 
we've talked about macro, meso, and micro, right? I have mm. to take the 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 whole suite of this. I take a long term view on how we do this. In the meantime, we work on mitigating the damage as much as we can. Right. So we have bills in uh, up here in California that are parole reform bills. We have bills that are working on fines and fees. Uh, we have bills that are working on the California voting rights. Uh, but we've, we've effectively abolished life without parole sentences for kids. People didn't know that we gave children life without parole sentences. And when we told the world that, you know, by the way, there's 15 year olds who are told you will never have the chance to ever go home. Uh, and by the way, most of them were locked up for being in the car or aiding and abetting. It was called the felony murder rule, meaning they didn't actually hurt anyone. They were present when somebody else got hurt. Wow. Right? So these kind of things, these when you tell someone that, that wow is what you hear because that's not the narrative that they had been sold, yeah. that we only lock up bad people who did something bad, not because they were born into the wrong family. We have families where they have the same parole agent for three generations of the family living in the same house. We don't tell that story. We tell the story about that bad minority kid who knocked over a liquor store and ended up killing the owner. We don't tell the context of a story. So these laws are narrative failures. If we change the narratives of how they're happening, we change the ability of people to be ignorant. You can't be willfully ignorant. If all of the media around you is suddenly telling a different story, yeah, you can turn love. a bly eye and be wigfully ignorant when the media is telling a convenient lie or convenient narrative. But if we're telling the truth and it's in your face, you can't choose to be willfully ignorant anymore. Yeah. And that's, and then like you just said, I mean, the dictation of the narrative um, is, is right where it starts. It's about getting the message out. And again, like I've said, if I can get it to one person, if I can get it to a, a million people, it's the fact that all I just want is people to have the facts and the education. And then you can make your decision. I, I can't control your decision. I can't control your bias and I can't control how you feel, but I need everyone to have all the information. And in the time we're in right now, what I've seen from most people is that they are so willfully ignorant of everything and they're learning things and they're like, I did not even know that. And I'm like, I don't know why you don't know that. It's American history. Why do you not know that? People, uh, uh, the, the current social unrest that's happening and the protests that are happening out there, the, the number of white people who call me to be an expert on black violence, uh, uh, sorry, on police violence, on black communities, I'm like, A, I'm a white dude. I'm here in support, but don't expect me to step into a leadership role because I wouldn't if I could. Right. It's not my fight. I'm here to support them, but I don't get to lead that fight. But the second thing is stop being fucking surprised. Right. If stop. you're surprised, it's because you haven't paid attention at all. Ever. This isn't new. The only thing is new that it's on camera now. Right. And by the way, there are places that are trying to outlaw filming police. Because they're scared of what happens when you film it. This is not new. This is just new to you. It's been going on forever. It's Stop been... being fucking surprised. And that's what's so strange to me. And maybe it is because I read a lot. Or maybe it's because I'm a history freak. Or maybe it's just because of the way I grew up. I'm baffled by the fact of how surprised. I think the, it, this isn't going to make sense in the context of English. But I'm going to say it. The most surprised I am is how surprised people are. How about that? <laughs> yeah. If that makes sense. I'm surprised with how surprised people are. I can't believe Look, it. I get it. White people are calling me because I'm a white guy and I'm well spoken and yada yada yeah. and they, they feel comfortable. That's not what they're saying, but that's the reason they're calling me. I'm like, do you not know a single black person you could talk to about this? <laughs> that's the funniest thing. I tell it's the weirdest thing because I have the same exact thing happening to me. And they're like, Hey, you know, we were looking if, you know, can you get, we want to send some product from our company. Can you call your friends and do, and I'm like, what, what is going on here? Do you, <laughs> do you not know anyone from the black community? Do you know no one? Like who, who would you been? And don't use me to try to put something on your Instagram. Like this is insane. And. It's again, I'm surprised at how surprised. While again, I like to always give the benefit of the doubt. I, I want, it's great that people are trying and it's great that they're stepping out there and it's amazing that people are doing their thing and they have to do that because this cannot be done alone. It has to be done with everybody, right? But at the same time, educate, 
go back and understand that this doesn't just stop with uh there has to be legislation in place, just like with prison. The prison is mirroring a lot of what's going on here. And hopefully this is that where we can tackle something that's in the same breath of what's going on right now. Because if you're going to say Black Lives Matter, you better start talking about the prison system. And you better Absolutely. start talking about what's going on in there and what's going on in the prison industrial complex. And that's where I'm going to put my focus to. So again, I... I appreciate you, brother. I, I I thank you for taking the time and um and it's let's let's honor, change the narrative. Let's change the narrative. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right, brother. All right. Take care and be safe, my friend. Yes, sir. That was Ryan Lowe. And uh, you know, really educating me. Um, hopefully uh you got something out of it like I did. I am um, I am on that path now. And this is something else that I feel compelled to not just learn more about, but to do the most I can to uh, help in this situation that a lot of people don't really want to give their time to. And I understand. I understand. You know, I, I've dealt with this and other things that I've, you know, done my best to bring awareness to. And this is something that I feel compelled to bring awareness to. So I thank you so much for listening and and starting to take this ride with me um, on this issue of prison reform and taking on the prison industrial complex. Um, it is a doozy. Um, so you know the deal. Um, Anywhere you go, hashtag theory pod, capital T H E O, small R Y, capital P O D. Um, seemingly the most important thing is going to Apple Podcasts and, you know, uh, subscribe, rate, review, Spotify, follow, anywhere else that you're, you know, absorbing your podcasts. And, uh, and yeah. That's the deal. We're we're going. This is uh we got so many things going on in this show. We got Reaper reviews. We got all different kind of guests and this is really just my mind exploding onto this microphone. I have a lot of varied interests and um I'm really really happy that you're all taking this journey with me. You know, I have a voice and so do you. And I'm going to use mine and I suggest you do too. So I appreciate you. I really do. And um, want the best for yourself. Because this is all going to be over in a blink. So um, let's have some fun. Let's make the best.